think I have a ghost in my attic, and I'm not sure what else to do. I've tried burning sage, and though I'm not religious, I am desperate. My friend found a priest willing to bless the place, but that only made things worse. When I moved in, things were normal for the first six months. The houses in my neighborhood were built in the 50s, and so far as I'm aware, no gruesome murders were ever committed there. They have to disclose that stuff, right? I should really Google that. Anyway, I tried asking a few neighbors about the house, but the previous owners were known for keeping to themselves. Though, judging by the way some people hurried off, there may be more to it. I've just never been much of a conversationalist, unless you're a hot girl. Oh, but back to the ghost stuff. The first incident happened last September. It was late on a Saturday night. I was watching TV in bed when clear, distinct footsteps began walking across the attic. They paced from end to end before stopping directly above my head, and I hurried out as quietly as possible. Convinced someone was inside, I ran into the street while calling 911, and officers were soon searching for an intruder. Unfortunately, more like tragically, there was no sign of anyone having been in there. The cameras didn't catch anyone coming or going. There isn't enough space for someone to hide in the attic, let alone stay there. Needless to say, I looked like a fool. One of the officers suggested I had a nightmare. As if 40 isn't old enough to distinguish a dream from reality. Though, after a week passed without further incident, I admittedly began to wonder. Everything was completely normal. I even went into the attic on occasion just to reassure myself of its emptiness. The only logical conclusion was that I hallucinated the entire episode. If not, then someone left without notice by myself or the cameras. I genuinely can't decide which is more likely or preferable. That's when the second incident occurred, again, while I was in bed. The footsteps resumed their pacing but they weren't overly loud or fast. It was almost like having an inconsiderate roommate, and that's how I tried to see it. How else could I cling to my sanity? I stared at my phone, cowering beneath the covers as I waited for the footsteps to seize. I didn't dare try 911 again, either, nor did I have the courage to look in the attic myself. Three minutes ticked by like three hours before the footsteps finally stopped, again, directly above my head, and remained still for the night. The sound of my pounding heart filled the void for several minutes, before the room fell into complete silence. That made for another sleepless night. I was officially becoming sleepless in Seattle. Most of you are probably too young for that joke, but like I said, at a certain point you just gotta take your jollies where you can. Part of me knew the excitement was finished for the night, but I stayed on edge all the time. Logic and reason play no part in what we fear or how we respond to it. In the end, we're merely helpless puppets at the mercy of our emotional whims. We can practice moderation, but control is a lofty goal indeed. The next morning, my brother came to check the house with me again. There were only a few boxes in the attic, so we moved them to the spare room, just to really see everything at once. There was absolutely no place to hide. I can add pictures later, but it's a small space. A few days later, the footsteps returned for the third time, only they seemed to be moving slightly faster than before, rather than hiding beneath the covers. I retreated to the den where I remained wide awake for yet another sleepless night. The following evening is when I burned sage, but the footsteps were back three days later. They were definitely walking faster and louder. If I had to describe the ghost's mood, I would have said indifferent just in the beginning, but now it seemed annoyed, and that scared me. If this thing could have moods... What would it be like when angry? Well, finding out was a short wait. 
I must have listened to those footsteps march across the attic for twenty minutes, before screaming like a girl at a sudden series of loud thuds. It took a moment to understand where it came from. The attic access door, the usual pull-down kind with the built-in steps, was being pushed open, just hard enough to pop it back into place. It only happened a few times, and when it stopped, so did the footsteps. I was almost numb to the idea of living with a ghost, but the terror of thinking I might see it, well, that's enough to change a man. I would have invited the Pope himself if I had the clout, but I was barely able to get a local priest. Even that only happened because my friend is luckily, coincidentally, a devout Catholic, which, believe me, I never thought I would classify that as lucky. The priest was here two days ago, and my meager reserves of self-restraint were utterly depleted by the end of his visit. I called him the holy man, and it definitely got us off on the wrong foot. Sometimes, late at night, I wonder if he intentionally made things worse, simply out of spite. I was only being friendly. There was a priest in my house, for fuck's sake. Life just can't prepare us for certain things. So we cope how we can in the moment. Sue me. Actually, now that I do think about it, each room took him a little less time. That bastard was definitely rushing the process. If I have a total meltdown over this mess, I'm paying him a little visit before they haul me off to the loony bin. Anyway, an hour after he left is when everything truly went to hell. Before the probably fake blessing. The incidents only occurred for short periods, and only late at night. But this one happened just after the sun began to set. The footsteps suddenly thundered across the attic. So hard that I could hear it downstairs in the kitchen. It sounded as if a very large man was running at full speed, stomping as loudly as possible. I was frozen in place, unable to draw a breath. I kept hoping if I stayed very still and very quiet, everything would just stop. Instead, it got worse. Without missing a step, the attic door joined in the chaos as it repeatedly banged open and closed. But that's not what shook me from my stupor. That didn't happen until I heard a different kind of thud. One I instantly recognized as the sound of a fold-out ladder slamming onto the floor. I didn't need to see confirmation. I'd made the sound myself enough times to be sure. Then, everything stopped. The house was left in complete silence. Minus my ragged breathing, obviously, but I didn't trust quiet. I've seen too many horror movies to go look behind door number one. Without hesitating, I grabbed my keys and got the hell out of there. Since that night, I've been sleeping at my brother's, but his wife is at her limit. That's why he and I are back at the house this evening. I'm not sure what he thinks he can do to help, but... It's nice just to be in my own bed again. I don't think anything will happen while he's here. But I almost hope it does. I'm sick of everyone looking at me like I'm crazy. Even having a real witness would be a huge relief at this point. Regardless, I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. All I can do is wait and see. I'll be back with an update when I have more to share. Thanks for listening. It was 1998, and my mom had just bought her first home, which, as a single mom, was a huge deal. It was a four-bedroom, one bath, with a family room and pool. The house was big, had lots of room for my brother and I to play. We were six and eight. Ever since mom was a child, she's been able to see demons. And because of her gift, the church used her to locate spirits. When I was four, she said that I would see them too, but I don't remember. She just said that I would react to them. 
I do feel and hear them, though. When we moved into that house, I felt a tall, dark figure in front of my bedroom door. He never dared come in, but he walked around the kitchen, which was right outside of my room. I never closed my bedroom door because I always felt him there. Because of it, I had to sleep with a nightlight in order to feel safe. If the light went off, I'd become paralyzed and sweat profusely until Mom brought a candle. Multiple times, I found the courage to demand he leave, and he did. On some occasions, I was able to sleep. A lot of weird things happened in that house, and Mom spoke to her pastor about it. When he came, he said that there was nothing that he could do because the spirits, they were using our home as a bridge, a bridge between the spirit world and our neighbors, who were summoning them. So, we just had to learn to live with that. For some months, I felt calm, and for others, I stayed in my room with a feeling of pure dread. That dark figure was there every night, and he only left when I told him to. At 21, I got a new dog. She slept with me and made me feel even safer. When I felt the figure, she'd bark at the door. The first time that she did, I knew I wasn't crazy, that it was never in my head. My dog gave me extra courage to send him away, and he did leave. I slept better than I did as a child. My dog also barked at the same area during the day. At 22, I moved out and I had my first child. Though my mom was awesome enough to let us stay with her for three months while we adjusted to our new life as parents and learned from her. The first night, I slept in mom's room with my son. My partner slept in my room, where there's just a sofa. The next morning, his eyes were filled with pure panic. A noise had awoken him in the night. In the room, the door was open. A tall, dark figure came closer and closer, but my partner wasn't able to move or speak. I always told him about the figure, but he always brushed it off as me being paranoid. Well, that day, he learned I wasn't lying. Years later, Mom sold the house to a lovely couple with a toddler and a baby on the way. But we heard that they sold it again. Now, it's being rented out. But no one wants it. I always ask my mom if it's because of the spirits. A lot more has happened in that house. But this was what happened to me. This is my dad's story, but I feel like it's worth telling. Dad was a builder, contracted to carry out projects on council buildings in the UK. This includes homes and flats. One of his jobs included an empty flat building with three levels and multiple rooms. When no one lives in them, they're called voids. It's just a building of empty rooms, so the council installs heavy metal doors to prevent thieves from entering. To get in, you need the keys. Rather than going in completely unprepared, Dad wanted to see the scale of the job beforehand. He went inside and noted four rooms on the ground, second and third floor, all connected by a staircase with metal bars for railings and a central shaft through the middle, where you can see straight up to the third floor ceiling. It was a big job, but achievable within a few days. He only needed to gut the place out, replaster a few walls, and repaint. Dad started to leave when he felt someone behind him. I'm told this isn't uncommon. Locals see builders go into empty buildings, and they want to see what they can take. Naturally, Dad turned around, saying that this person had to go so that he could lock up. But no one was there. Thinking it was just an odd sensation, he finished locking up and went home. He told Mom what had happened, but it was only a passing remark. Nothing else was said. Anyway, after the weekend, 
Dad and his friend Martin returned to the site to begin their work. A local resident approached them and asked how things were going. Both men agreed things were good. They exchanged a bit of small talk. Then the stranger suddenly changed the subject, asking, It's a shame what happened there, isn't it? Dad and Martin were confused and asked the man to elaborate. Apparently, a girl came home from school a few months ago to see her father hanging. He'd tied himself to the railing and jumped. Of course, now my dad was scared, and he felt a familiar shiver. He didn't tell the stranger what he felt, but he told his friend. Martin refused to go into the building alone, and they agreed to always leave the central door open for a quick exit. Dad would be the first to say that he doesn't believe in ghosts. He would also say that he's never seen one, but he calls this the oddest experience of his life, and he can't explain it. I've been reading a lot of strange stories, so I thought this would be a good place for mine. It happened over 30 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Every summer, I spent June and July serving hard labor on Grandpa's farm, and if I never have to see another live pig, I'll die happy. I hated it there, but my opinion didn't count for much. In fact, it didn't count for fuck at all. But the point is, I was there. Grandpa needed help, and I was the only one too young to say no. It's true what they say about farming. You really do gotta wake up at 5 a.m. every goddamn day. My chore list got a little bit longer with each trip, so the summer before senior year was especially brutal. But knowing it was my last infused me with just enough strength to persevere. Admittedly, Persevere is a strong word, a strong, inaccurate word, but I survived, and I never served time in a psych ward. That, my friends, is called winning. Collectively, I spent a grand total of 20 months on that farm, and at least triple that just thinking about it. In all that time, I never experienced anything unusual until the final summer. Luckily, this actually has nothing to do with farming. Only my grandpa's house, but more specifically, his basement. It was the morning of June 11th, and I was coming downstairs to breakfast when the old man's shrill curses reached my ears. I almost turned around, but that would only make things worse. Grandpa was one of those hard asses who wanted you to look at him cross so that he could beat you senseless. That's how he got his jollies. At this time, he was really mad. I could practically hear his face turning red as spit flew, and I knew that that one vein would be predominant on his forehead. When I entered the kitchen, the basement door stood open, and Grandpa was at max volume downstairs, but I could also hear another sound, the sound of running water. I rushed halfway down the stairs before coming to a sudden stop. The room was flooding from a busted pipe, and the water was already three to four inches above Grandpa's ankles. I called out, but he didn't even look at me before finding the main shutoff valve. With the floodgates finally closed, Grandpa took notice of me, but he still had that look. So I quickly averted my gaze, lest he interpret it as a challenge. Thankfully, he had bigger concerns at the moment, and I returned to being invisible. Once he was safely back up the stairs, I rolled up my pants and dove in. A ton of stuff was getting ruined. Random junk was floating by the steps, and dozens of boxes were half-submerged. If I didn't fish them out, I would be the only one to blame later. I began placing boxes onto higher shelves as I circled the room, but in the corner, opposite the stairs, I froze at the sound of a large splash behind me. Grandpa didn't have any pets, and there's no way he returned to help. My head snapped to the sound's direction, but 
Nothing was there. Just the same, almost calm, water surface. After several minutes of total silence, I tried to resume my duties, and I think that's what something was waiting for. The moment I bent over, something brushed past my leg. I imagine it's exactly what it would feel like if I were standing in a pool and someone swam by, except the water obviously wasn't deep enough for that to actually happen. I screamed like a girl, but Grandpa didn't return. I thought he simply hadn't heard me, but I made a break for the stairs and he was finishing his breakfast in the kitchen. He didn't seem the least bit phased by my outburst. He didn't even acknowledge me. All he did was mutter about expensive repairs and today's pansy youth. I was too shaken up to put much thought into his exact words, but I wish I had. After a hot meal and a moment to calm down, I felt fairly foolish for panicking. With a renewed sense of false courage, I returned to the flooded basement and resumed my place in the far corner. Everything was fine. I felt ridiculous for having worried, but only for a few seconds. As I bent down to pick up the last box, a cold, bone-thin hand clamped around my ankle in a steel-tight grip. My mouth opened wide, but no scream emerged, only a soft, dry croak. I wanted to pull my leg free to run, but I was paralyzed, and the grip on my ankle grew tighter. I expected my bone to snap at any moment. Desperate, I dared to look down into the murky water, and though I can never be sure if what I saw was real or merely my own warped reflection, there was a ghastly, white, pallid face staring back at me. The eye sockets were black and hollow, the cheeks were drawn, and its mouth was frozen in a silent scream. Maybe I went into shock, or maybe I had a panic attack. Either way, I couldn't breathe. It felt like my lungs were filling with water, and I couldn't get air. I couldn't choke. I couldn't fight back. I was completely helpless and I have no clue how long I stayed that way. I only know that eventually, Grandpa was there, holding my head above water, shaking me like a crying newborn. I wasn't standing anymore. I was lying in the water, and the old man looked every bit as terrified as I felt. We didn't speak about what happened. He helped me upstairs. We called some plumbers, and they had the basement empty by that evening. Now, if nothing else had happened, I would think that I had a fit of temporary insanity or something and move on, but not with how things turned out. Grandpa's pipes were so old that they all needed to be replaced. To do that, a lot of the walls had to be ripped open, including one of the basements. There was a body in that bitch. The police were never able to identify the remains, but it was a male and the top half of the skull was missing. I've just never really been able to process the whole thing. Sometimes I wonder if Grandpa killed that man. He fought the plumbers every step of the way. The police talked to him for a really long time, too. They didn't leave him alone until he got a lawyer. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything, does it? The old man died about 15 years ago, and on his deathbed... I asked him if he did it, but his mind was too far gone to answer. I guess it's one of those things I'll never know, but it feels much better to share my story with people who will believe it. Thanks for that. I have a close friend who's more like a brother than my actual brothers. We're a lot alike and vastly different. Yet we fit together very well. I'm religious, yet he's agnostic. I'm open to the existence of spirits, but he doesn't believe in that stuff. 
He's always been skeptical of ghosts, haunted places, karma, mediums, tarot cards, astrology. Well, you get the picture. I, on the other hand, think hauntings could be evil spirits, but I won't go into that too much. My friend and I, we had a long conversation about different things when it comes to this stuff. He doesn't believe in anything that he can't see with his own eyes. And he teases me about different things, like the time I went on a ghost tour, or when I visited the Winchester house in Gettysburg. One day, he came over to meet with me, and he looked very serious, almost distressed. I thought that there had been an accident, and that someone had died. But instead, he proceeded to explain what happened while home alone with his young daughter. His wife had taken their older child shopping, it was getting late, nearly eight o'clock, so he got his daughter ready for bed. No one else was home. Their house was an older rental property, maybe from the 30s. It was small, but it sat on a big lot. And it was very dark, had a huge tree blocking most of the sunlight. While his daughter was taking a bath, he was laying out her pajamas and getting a towel ready when he saw a woman walking down the hallway. He described her as having long black hair, like his wife, wearing a red top. Assuming it was his wife, he called out to her, but she didn't answer. Confused, he poked his head into the hallway, expecting to see their bedroom light turned on, but it was as dark as the hallway. He called out again, but there was still no response. He went into the bedroom, turned on the light, and he felt a shiver run down his spine, like an irrational fear. Then he hurried back to his daughter and told her to finish up. He kept looking for the woman. The front and the back doors were locked. Outside, his car was the only one in the driveway. His wife definitely hadn't returned. He grabbed a hammer, started searching room to room, but he found nothing. He called his wife, and she was still a target. So he took his daughter to her room and went around turning off every light. When his wife came home, he pulled her aside and told her about the lady. Like myself, she also believes in ghosts and said, Yeah, I didn't want to tell you, but I know this house is haunted. My friend was so unraveled that he fixed himself a straight bourbon. Drank it in one gulp and then stayed up the entire night, expecting to see that woman again. I was eight or nine when this happened. Every night around 2 a.m., I used to hear a hammering sound coming from the first floor of our three-story house. The hammering sound always came from the first floor. I always thought my uncle may be responsible because he often complained that he couldn't sleep. I thought that he might have found a new hobby or something, but no one else ever mentioned the noise. Anyways, my bedroom was on the third floor. It had a balcony with a wooden door. One night, my father was out of town and the rest of my family was asleep. So I decided to stay up all night and watch TV, but I fell asleep. I woke up to a loud banging sound coming from the balcony door. I immediately got up and asked in a brave voice, Who's out there? But the banging only got louder. I screamed. My mom rushed up to ask what was happening. I was crying, so she hugged me and asked again. As I was trying to tell her, the banging started again, and it was so brutal that I thought the door might break. Mom called Dad and his cop friend. When the officer came, he checked the balcony, but nothing was there. He even asked us to check in with him so that we wouldn't be afraid of our own house. Nothing like that ever happened again, and the hammering sound stopped as well. I never asked my family about that hammering because I'm still worried I might be the only one who heard it.
I was a nurse for seven years, and I worked at a single facility for my entire career. The facility had many renovations done since opening in 1960. By 2011, when I started there, only half of the facility was still the original building. The rest had been added over the years. I worked nights, mostly because I'm a night owl and found it easier. I had a number of odd experiences, but I'll share the main ones that stick with me. Firstly, I've had experiences with the supernatural since age three, so I believe in the supernatural, but wasn't obsessed. It's more like I was simply aware of it, if that makes sense. There was one wing in particular, part of the original building, that had a small sitting room with a television for residents to enjoy during the day. During my night shifts, this one area gave me such a feeling of dread that I would only be near it when necessary. I took the long way back to the nurse's station just to avoid being near it. I don't know of anything that happened there, but my gut instinct screamed that something was there, and it was not happy. This feeling eased during the day, but each night, the feeling was there. It felt as if someone was watching me, and they didn't like my presence. I spoke to a few other nurses about this, and they all claimed to experience the same feelings. One other incident that sticks with me. A 90-year-old woman, I'll call Jane, went to breakfast, and then asked to return to her room for a nap. She was a very healthy woman, but she said she wasn't feeling well. When the nurse did her next rounds, 20 minutes later, she found that the resident had passed away in her sleep. It was an aortic aneurysm, so she didn't suffer. Unfortunately, death is rarely quick in aged care. It's usually a slow process of days or weeks. Jane was a very sweet Polish lady. She outlived her children, and her husband had passed away many years ago. So she never had visitors. At exactly 9.30 p.m., I would check on her, bring her tea before saying goodnight. As you can probably guess, not everything goes to schedule and health care, and it's not always possible to stick to a strict routine. But if I was even five minutes late, she would ring her call bell, ask for her tea, and apologize profusely for ringing her bell. Every time I answered with, whenever you need help, press the button. It's no trouble. I love to help. Then she would say her usual, good night, sweet girl, and I'd get on with my shift. The funeral home was late picking her up. I helped the undertaker that afternoon when I started my shift. All the rooms had call bells next to the toilet, next to the bed, and the residents wore one on a necklace or bracelet, too. When a resident passes, the room bells are disconnected the same day, and the personal bell is put with the nurse's station, ready for the next person to move in. At 9.36, the call bell to her room started ringing. This was not possible. Her room had been disconnected and her personal bell was sitting in a drawer next to me. Slightly freaked out, I went to her room to ensure no dementia patient had wandered in. I considered maintenance simply hadn't turned the bells off, even though I personally spoke to them after they did so. I was just trying to rationalize it, I guess. I went into the room, and it was pitch black. No one was inside, and the bells had definitely been turned off. I couldn't turn it off from inside the room. I had to cancel it from the main desk. I instantly had a feeling of peace, which was weird because in every other situation, I would have been a mess. I think she was saying goodbye. As I was closing her room, I heard a shriek. My best friend came running down the corridor, crying and in a state. Once I got her calmed down, she said, I was in X-Wing, charting, and Jane walked past me in her nighty. Then she turned the corner to the front wing, but when I looked around the corner, she wasn't there. She's dead. What the fuck did I just see? Mm. 
Back around 1992, I was a sophomore in high school. And unlike most of my friends, I didn't work a typical fast food or retail job. I was great with my hands, and I did things like construction, demolition, flooring, auto mechanics. I started working at 14, so I was always paid under the table. It was beneficial for both sides since I was only called when needed, and I was willing to work evenings and weekends. One of my employers did remodeling jobs like restaurants, bars, retail shops, commercial projects. Those were the kind that were perfect for me because they could only be worked on after hours and weekends. It wasn't uncommon for one employer to leave me alone with a list of things to do, mostly demolition. I did this while the other crew worked on installation and remodeling. I was a kid, but they respected me because I did what I was supposed to do. And I did it without complaints. I was paid well. I made more in one night than my friends at McDonald's made all week. One day, I got a call about a project for the following Saturday. I was told to bring food, drinks, because there was nothing nearby. I filled a small cooler with Cokes, Gatorade, chips, and a couple sandwiches. Back then, I could eat a whole pizza and burn it off. I didn't have a license yet, so starting that Saturday, my employers picked me up, drove me to the site, and left me there, alone. I rarely worked with other crew members. They were all the skilled labor guys. I was just the demo kid. This part was my major downfall. I didn't pay attention to where we were going. I was too busy talking about cars, and at the time, my goal was to save up enough money to buy an old muscle car and rebuild it. It took a long time to arrive at the site. It was in the middle of nowhere. You may not think California has places like this, but back in the early 90s, there were big plots of land and homes out in the Mojave Desert. We left the highway and went down a few other two-lane roads for a long distance. He asked about my drinks and pulled out a jug of water that he had in his truck. It looked like it had been there a while, but he told me to take it since the water to the house I was working on was shut off. As we pulled up to the property, he was in a hurry to get to another site. So I hurried to help him unload the breaker bars, shovels, pry bar, hammer, broom, trash bins, and the small tool bag. He said that he would pick me up at five or six, since there was no electricity at the site either. That was his way of saying that I was only getting paid until then. It was never too outrageous, and we always had a good understanding of those kinds of things. He drove away, and I was left all alone. I walked into the mostly empty house, and I began removing what was left of the furniture and appliances, ripping out the floors, gutting the kitchen and bathrooms. Removing the paneling was next. This project was what we now call a flip. They were going to fix it up and sell it. Almost immediately, I got a little bit spooked by the place. It was very odd. Now, remember, I was used to working alone all night, and this was the middle of a sunny Saturday. The house was old, dark, musty, and sort of cool, the kind of cool that gives you goosebumps. To add to the spook factor, let me describe what I remember about the house. Imagine being back in the 60s. There was dark green carpet that looked like matted down broccoli, pine wood with dark stains, old granny curtains, an avocado green sink, and the paneling was actual tongue and groove boards. The old furniture and stuffed animals looked at least 30 years old. The overall style was right out of an old western ranch. There were actual wagon wheels inside and outside the home. I had an old battery-powered radio that only picked up a few stations, but I was just happy for the noise. I started removing all the junk, and as I normally did, when there wasn't a dumpster on site, I made a trash pile. I tore the flooring out next, and to my delight, everything came up with ease. All I had to do was rip, cut, toss. Then, I used a big demo hammer to tear apart the kitchen in less than an hour. 
I ended up using the big jug of water to periodically wash my hands and face, but by late noon, the desert dryness starts taking the moisture from you. By then, I was down to my last drink and had already eaten everything I brought. No worries. The guys should be here in a couple of hours, right? As the time for them to arrive neared, I finished the last of my tasks. I even swept the entire place so that it could be ready for the rehab crew to start making it look modern. It wasn't a typical hot desert day for that time of year, but as soon as the sun set, it began to cool rapidly. I had on a flannel shirt, but that wasn't enough, and it was starting to get dark. This was before cell phones became common, and the house had no electricity, no water, or phone. I climbed on top of the roof, hoping to see something in the distance. And miles down, I saw the road connected to a smaller road. There were a few homes, but they were all dark. My first thought was to hike to the neighbor's house and ask to use the phone. But no one was home, and this home also looked abandoned. The early 90s was the start of a recession, so it wasn't uncommon for a lot of foreclosed homes to be in track of occupied homes. I worked in a lot of those at the time. I started thinking about my options as it grew darker. I could stay at the house until morning, hike a few miles with what water I had left, or wait until morning and start hiking then. I also realized that no one knew where I was except my boss. I don't know if he told anyone else where I was, and my family wouldn't miss me until at least Sunday night. I didn't even tell them that I was going to work there. They knew how much I would work to save up for my car. So they never worried about me not coming home. I didn't have a flashlight or any way to make a fire. But the night sky looked amazing and the moon was bright. Of course, that doesn't mean I didn't try. I was going to make a small fire out of construction debris when the temperature hit the low 40s, but that didn't pan out. My only option was to wait inside the empty, creepy house that seemed even creepier when sitting alone in the dark. At roughly 8 p.m., my radio's batteries start to die. It was my only source of little light and noise. I grabbed a wooden chair, and I sat in the living room, facing the door. I heard wind odd animal noises, and what sounded like leaves crunching under feet. I started shivering from the cold, so I tried to make a fire in the fireplace. Picture Tom Hanks trying to start a fire in Castaway. At least it was keeping my mind on my situation. Sitting there next to the fireplace made the house seem even darker than it should have. It was already dark in the daytime, but now, even with the moonlight... I was essentially sitting in complete darkness. My mind started to play tricks on me. I saw shadows moving inside and outside. I also heard someone talking or whispering. So I got up from my chair and I yelled, Hello? The instant I did, something fell on the other side of the house. I ran back outside. At least I could see better in the moonlight. I heard noises and I saw movement in the distance, but I couldn't make anything out of it. I had my tools sitting next to the corner of the house, ready for my boss to return. So I ran to them, grabbed the big daddy. It was the heavy pry bar that I'd used for the demolition, and I was ready to defend myself from who or whatever was out there. I have to keep moving because my shirt wasn't enough to keep me warm. The wind was also picking up. There wasn't a single light around me. I didn't want to risk falling in the dark if I tried to climb back onto the roof. So I got on top of the gate, hoping to see some house or car lights. I immediately thought of the horror stories that people tell about Satanist groups. Strange disappearances. People coming to the Mojave Desert just to bury bodies. Every noise had me on edge. Every shadow had my heart pounding. I knew no one was in that house, but I swore I heard noises from inside. I huddled up on the front porch, 
looking into the living room window, expecting to see someone any moment. So much had already happened by eleven that I knew it was going to be a long night. I didn't know how I was going to make it another six hours until daybreak. The moment light started to appear on the horizon, I planned to take what little water remained and walk east. I knew going east would eventually lead me to a paved road. Closer to midnight, I was wide awake with my eyes fixed on the dirt road, thinking a car would come any minute. I kept turning to look inside each time I heard a new noise. I tried to tell myself that it was just a rat or some other kind of rodent. I saw a shadow move from the kitchen to the hall, and I jumped out of my seat, knowing it was human, not an animal. I started backing my way off the porch towards the debris pile, but I tripped and I fell on the ground. I scrambled back to my feet, but fell again. It was like something pushed me down, and suddenly there were bright lights coming closer as I laid there. I jumped up and saw my boss. He was giving me a what-the-heck-are-you-doing look, but I was just glad to see him. I couldn't even be mad. I asked him what happened, and he apologized, but he thought the other crew was coming to get me. It wasn't until he asked the other crew leader how far along I'd gotten that they realized their mistake. It took him almost two hours to get there from where they were, and he felt terrible enough to pay me for the entire time I was there. He also gave me a Coke from his cooler, and I drank it in one gulp. Once we got back to civilization, we went to a drive through and I ate like I'd never eaten before. On the drive home, I asked about the house and told him how creepy it was. He said he didn't have any information on the home, only what we were supposed to do. After that, I made sure to always have extra batteries, flashlights, and double the amount of liquid. So we moved into my apartment in 2018, 2019. It didn't start immediately. It started randomly. Little things like stuff moving to different places, feeling like something was watching me. One day last year, me and my sister were watching YouTube, and it randomly changed to Hulu. The remote was on the table. We changed it back to YouTube, and it went back to Hulu again. We were spooked, so we decided to play a game. While we were playing, we heard a step in my sister's room. We were home alone. We were scared, but I got up, went to my sister's room, and I saw a shadow figure just in the corner of my eye. We were pretty spooked, but nothing happened after that besides tiny stuff. Fast forward to yesterday. I had a friend over, and we were playing Just Dance. We heard something fall in the kitchen. We went to investigate, and we saw that a lid had fallen. It didn't make sense because it was on the counter before when we were in there. Either way... We just went back to playing Just Dance. I have to be home alone today, and honestly, I don't know what to do. Just an update. My friend left, and nothing really happened until 11 p.m. I saw a shadow figure in the corner of my eye again, and my dog started to bark in that direction for 15 minutes. So, I think my apartment is haunted. Summer of 2022. I'm a cadet, and we had to stay in this old army base. Can't give the location, obviously. And this happened about a week in. One night, I had to pee really bad. And basically, my dorm was at the very bottom of this long hall. As I entered the toilet, I began to feel very uncomfortable, like someone was watching me. I went into the nearest stall and... I did my business. I went over to the sink to wash my hands. I heard the door slam at the other end of the toilets, but I brushed it off as one of my fellow cadets. But then, 
The door stall that I was just in slammed shut, and my heart was in my throat. There was no way that it could have been a gust of wind because it was relatively warm. I've never shared this story until now. Nothing can explain that night. The horror of Gladstone Villa is that there was more than one ghost there, and it was meant for one family. This was a genuine experience that even convinced a skeptic and a non-believer, so it's worth a look, and it needs to be documented and shared with others. You may research this. What the family experienced defined rational explanation, such as very mild poltergeist activity, like lights going off and on, electrical cables being pulled by unseen forces, and there was the occasional sighting, but this was very rare. All of this occurred in the former mining town of Bargoid, in the Carfilly County borough of the South Wales Valleys. All from 1969 to June 1978. Bill Higgs and his wife Rita moved into Gladstone Villa with their only daughter Caroline sometime back in 1960. Everything was fine. No incidents at all. Caroline left school in 1965 and got a job in the bakehouse in Baldwin Street. Days regular. It was at the bakehouse that she met Douglas Dexter. He was from the neighboring village of Arbor Bargoid. He was nights regular, but he often stayed behind to make a cup of tea for Caroline. They started dating and were together for three years before they got married April 1968. They didn't get their own place. They lived at Gladstone Villa with Bill and Rita. Douglas and Carolyn's son was born August 1969, and it was soon after this that things started to happen. Caroline said it all started off in the attic. The family were all downstairs when they heard what sounded like someone jumping on the landing from the ceiling. They looked to see what was going on, naturally thinking it was a break-in. But when they reached the top of the landing, nobody was there. But the hatch to the attic, it was open. From that day on, the odd activity continued on a daily basis, and whatever it was eventually occupied itself in the master bedroom, which incidentally belonged to Bill and Rita. Noises like loud bangs and dragging sounds could be heard. Footsteps were heard in the bedroom every evening, sometimes during the day when the family would be downstairs watching TV. Bill would turn the volume down to hear it more clearly. Caroline said that on one occasion, she went up to her son Andrew's cot to find the pillow torn in half. Bill would record the noises with his tape recorder, and once he played it back, he heard the sound of an ambulance pulling up outside, but there was no ambulance. A warning. Soon after this, Andrew was in the Cardiff Hotel, in an oxygen tent. He, of course, recovered from this. A priest was called to Gladstone Villa. He blessed the property, and after a few short prayers, he duly left. But before he left, he parted with these words. Watch the baby. As Andrew got older, he too witnessed the poltergeist activity for himself. He saw the cables being pulled by unseen forces. It all got so bad that the family slept downstairs with the lights on. Only Bill was supposedly brave enough to sleep in that particular room. One time he had a rather frightening experience in there. He was lying on the bed, and then he couldn't move, not even shout out for his family to help him. This could have very well been sleep paralysis, but he said later that he felt something in the room with him. A medium was called to Gladstone Villa. He asked the family questions, and then he began to challenge the spirit by knocking on the ceiling, and it immediately knocked back at him. At some point... He went into a trance to try to make contact, but he failed to get a name. He later said that there was a presence there, 
and that it was an earthbound spirit. It had unfinished business, something that it didn't do in life. There were a few more sightings. One evening, the family was watching TV. Carolyn just so happened to look to her left. She saw the full-bodied figure of a monk standing behind the sofa near the doorway. She later described it in detail as a monk in typical brown habit, complete with a hood over the head. The family left Gladstone Villa in June 1978, and two local businessmen bought the property. It eventually became Red's Park Hotel. Andrew had his 40th birthday there for old time's sake, and it was the staff who told Andrew that they too had experienced things there. Andrew did a thorough research into the history of Gladstone Villa and the area. He found out from local librarians that Gladstone Villa dated back to the 1900s, and a monastery was close by. This explains the monk that Carolyn saw. This is a true story. A little background for context. This past Thanksgiving was hard for my family. It was the first Thanksgiving without my biological grandmother. I called her Nana. Her life partner is my other grandmother, who I call Nain. So, just wanted to get that out of the way. On Thanksgiving night, me, Nain, and my half-brother were sitting in the living room, reminiscing on past Thanksgiving we'd spent with Nana, when we heard something fall in the master bedroom. Nain had closed the door to keep the dogs out of there, so no one or nothing was in there. We brushed it off and decided to put a movie on, and we were watching it when we heard voices coming from that room. We paused the movie to listen but we couldn't quite make out what they were saying. We assumed it was just the neighbors and were about to continue the movie when we heard a voice call out for Nain in my Nana's voice. Only it wasn't her. We all knew it. Again, she called out this time for me. This time the tone in her voice was urgent, like she was hurting. Help me. We heard her cry. My older brother, who's never really encountered nor cared for the supernatural, was shaking as he tried to get up when Nain shouted, something she's never done. Don't open that door. Again, we heard my Nana crying while pounding on the door. When at 11.52 p.m., it was quiet. That was the time she died. Till this day... We haven't spoken of what happened. Nain had me sage the entire house the next day. When I was 12, I visited our family ranch in the Mexico countryside for the first time in years. The property has been in our family for centuries. The pictures and paintings of my ancestors hanging throughout the ranch always made me want to get home before dark. All of my cousins were in a separate room, eating and talking. When I went to the bathroom, I noticed a door right next to the bathroom. I assumed it was a bedroom, but I didn't check out of respect for my uncle, the owner. While doing my business, I heard what sounded like an old wooden rocking chair, rocking in the next room. I didn't think much of it. I went on to washing my hands and... That's when I heard nails clawing at the bathroom door. I didn't panic right away. I know how my cousins can be, and I thought someone who needed to use the bathroom was just playing a lighthearted prank. But when I opened the door, no one was there. I rushed back to my cousins, and I brushed off the situation without mentioning it. Later that day, my cousins told me some scary stories about the ranch, and they revealed it was haunted. They said an old lady used to live in the room next to the bathroom, and sometimes, when you're near her space, she'll rock in her chair. The 
The following is a true story that happened in the early 90s, when I was 14 and still living with my parents. The previous year, my dad worked for a government contractor, and his job moved us 200 miles from our hometown. It seemed like the middle of nowhere. We moved during my freshman year, but dad moved first to find a new house while the old one sold. We ended up staying in a rental for a short period until my parents found the right house a few months later. The suburb we used to live in was super expensive, but the new homes in our new town were much cheaper. My parents took advantage of that and bought a huge home. We went from a single-story, three-bedroom, one-bath house to a two-story, five-bedroom, three-bath home. I didn't get to see the new place before my parents made an offer, since they looked while I was in school. When they drove by for the first time, it looked like a mansion compared to our other house. I missed my friends and my old neighborhood, but this house looked so cool. It was in the oldest part of the city, and there were lots of new construction everywhere, but my parents got a great deal. Once we went inside, I knew why. It was evening when we got the keys, so by the time we met the realtor and drove to the new house, it was already dark, which made it even creepier. Inside, it was like a time capsule. Everything looked like it was frozen in 1960. It also had a funny smell, like the place had been empty for years. I later learned it had actually been vacant for almost eight years before we bought it. It was still odd that the previous owners never updated anything. For example, there was shag carpet everywhere. The rooms had avocado green, and the others had burnt orange. All the appliances were from the 60s, and the rooms were painted weird colors. It looked like a hippie's crash pad. They began renovations immediately. Dad was a handy guy. Plus, we have family members who are proficient in different fields like flooring, painting, and carpentry. Dad called in lots of help. And finally, we moved in once the work was complete. Certain parts of the house always made me feel uneasy. I can't explain it, but I saw shadows. Lights turned on and off and my sister's hair dryer even turned on at 2 a.m. once. The most common occurrence was the footsteps. I would hear them coming upstairs at night when everything was quiet. A year after we moved in, I was the first to notice something odd about the house. It started when I asked my parents to switch to an upstairs room because it was bigger, had a walk-in closet. They agreed I began thinking about the upstairs layout. Most of it was taken up by the big open space that we used as a family room. There was a hallway leading to the two bedrooms and one bathroom. But the layout didn't make sense. There was a void behind the bedroom adjacent to mine and the bathroom. There was almost enough room for another bedroom, but that space extended over the garage. One day... I drew a diagram of our house, but I couldn't figure out why there was such a big void, and Dad only shrugged it off. Eventually, I looked at it from the outside and noticed something odd. There used to be a window there. It was covered up by a big vent and a sloppy patch of stucco. Now, super curious, I studied the layout again, and I noticed the bathroom wall had a patch job in the shape of a doorway. I was right about there being another room, but why did someone close it off? Obviously, Dad would have killed me if I broke open the wall, but I had an idea. I just wasn't sure if it would work. I waited for my parents to visit family, and I stayed home. I knew they'd be gone for hours because of the distance. If I went up to the attic crawl space and broke through the drywall there. Dad may never notice. He had no reason to go up there. I grabbed some tools and began cutting through the drywall. Eventually, I made an opening big enough to crawl through between the studs, and I was right. 
there was another room. I was half excited and half terrified. I was excited to be right, but after looking around the room, it was obvious that it used to be a bedroom. The walls were pink. There was no carpet, no padding, just strips around the walls. I could see where they closed off the entrance, and there were no closet doors either. It looked like posters had been ripped off the walls, and the floors were littered with cigarette butts, old beer cans, all from the 70s or 80s. As I noticed from the outside, the window was removed, some metal vent covering the opening. I only brought a cheap flashlight, and even though it was daytime, the room seemed very dark. I started feeling really creeped out, and the smell was terribly old and musty. I got out and began moving boxes into the crawl space, so I could say I found it while cleaning the garage. When my parents returned, I said I was moving boxes when I noticed the hole and made it bigger to find the room. They didn't get mad, but they seemed almost disappointed, like I stumbled onto a secret. They eventually admitted that the realtor had told them about the room. I wanted to reopen it and make it a six-bedroom house, but Dad said to just leave it alone. As time passed, I occasionally took my friends to the mystery room. After creating that opening, things got even creepier around the house. The footsteps were louder on the stairs. We saw shadows in the dark. And once, a family friend screamed when she saw a woman in the mirror while walking up the stairs. She thought it was my mom, but it vanished when she turned away. Another time, a friend was sleeping in the other room, and he ran outside in the middle of the night, wearing only his boxers. He said that someone was whispering in his ear. When I was 16, I spoke with an older neighbor, and he was one of the original owners in the neighborhood. I asked him about the house, and he said the son who used to live there went to prison back in the early 70s. He wouldn't go into details, but he said it was really sad and to not let drugs ruin my life. I looked up old newspapers at the library, but I only found one article about a teen who killed a family member and attempted to kill his parents before being arrested. My family moved out shortly after I turned 17, and I've never been back. My name is Zach. I don't believe in ghosts, but my experience still haunts me. I just can't really explain what I've seen, felt, and heard. When my mother was with her ex-boyfriend, we moved into his house. It was yellow, built in 1970, and located in the Seminahina countryside, near Paris. The last owners were probably an old couple, but I never asked. That was in 2011. I spent three years there before my mom and stepfather separated. Among the strange events that occurred, I remember the reversed cross on the garage ceiling. It was caused by humidity, but every time we fixed it, the shape always reappeared on the same spot. My cat used to yell like he was in pain when he walked beneath the cross, but I assumed it was pure coincidence. One night, a friend slept over while my family was away. I had to get something from my mom's bedroom, and I felt like I was being watched. Mom used to hate her room, because she sometimes woke up thinking a stranger was lying next to her. When I returned to my room, my friend was terrified. Her face was blank as she described seeing something through the window. It was probably a bird or an owl, but the creepy feeling was mutual. One of the craziest episodes happened during a party. We were talking with two friends while standing near a Buddha statue and mirrors. We were calm. No one was on any drugs. Then, all of the mirrors suddenly fell, 
and the statue's head was sliced off while the body remained standing. Everyone was shocked and asking for an explanation. Maybe it was the temperature, but it was just a regular April night. I don't remember any weird weather issues. Then there's the story about why we replaced our TV so often. The screen used to activate itself, change channels even when we were watching something. Technicians said it was something they couldn't fix because the device was too old. Did I mention the bathroom mirror? Yeah, I know it sounds cliche, but I never saw a ghost in the mirror. It was always dirty, even if we cleaned it on a daily basis. It reminds me of the inverted cross. Anyway, my fiancé and I now have our own flat. It's a cool atmosphere, but sometimes I think about my nights in that yellow house. Ghosts or not, there's definitely something haunting my memories. This is a story about an old house in a rural part of central Massachusetts. The house was originally half of a hotel. The other half was nearby. For some reason, that always perplexed me. The two halves were separated. It was one huge, three-story Victorian structure with wide porches. My parents were friends with the homeowners, and they would host big parties. The mother would sing and play the piano. There were always lots of kids. We ran around while the adults socialized. Of course, this was over 40 years ago, so my memories of the house are vague. I remember the house had more rooms than the family could ever use. On the third floor were several hotel rooms, still largely unchanged since it was in operation. The owners openly talked about the house being haunted, and I was always fascinated by their stories. Odd things would happen, such as finding the phone receiver out of its cradle, or sometimes light bulbs went missing unscrewed from the socket and spirited away. The incident that left the deepest impression supposedly happened to the mother. One afternoon, she was vacuuming on the third floor when she turned to see a man standing in the room, motionless and staring. He wore a gray suit, wire-rimmed glasses. He never spoke. He just stood there, staring. Caught off guard and flustered, she said the first thing that came to mind. Would you like a cup of coffee? He vanished before her eyes. I never understood why someone would offer a cup of coffee to an apparition, but my mother explained it as being aware of a presence. She felt it was benevolent and wanted it to feel welcome. Sorry, there isn't more to share, I wonder if the house is still there today. This happened when I was a little girl, staying at a friend's house for my first sleepover, and way before I knew about ghostly things. My friend lived with her grandparents in the country. They had an old one-story brick house, five bedrooms and a big playroom. They had a lot of antique things like glass cabinets, old china, a piano, and those weird porcelain baby dolls. She always told me stories about her house being haunted, but I didn't believe her. I thought she was just trying to scare me. It was almost dark when her grandparents went to town for groceries, leaving us and my friend's older brother behind. We started playing hide-and-seek, and it was my turn to count. I could hear them rummaging around and giggling in her room, so I went that way first. I was talking loud and looking in obvious places to throw her off when, from the corner of my eye, I saw her run into a room that I hadn't checked yet. The door was ajar, so I crept in. It was the piano room. I could see someone crouch down behind the piano, so I worked my way around it, hoping to scare her when I suddenly heard her and her brother calling for me. Confused, I stepped out to see both of them standing in the living room, asking if I planned to look for them. I 
explained how I thought she ran into the piano room, and both of their smiles instantly faded as they said, We don't go in there. That's her room. Then they explained that the house had been around for generations. When their grandmother was a child, she had a younger sister who had been in an accident in the barn. She had been messing with the cattle, and she died in that room when they brought her inside to tend to her wounds. I said I didn't believe them, that there was no way. They were just trying to scare me. Ghosts aren't real. The piano room door slammed shut, and you could hear a low tune playing. The brother said that that kind of thing always happened, and there was nothing to be afraid of. She just likes to play, but she always tries to scare new people. I didn't stick around to see anything else. As soon as her grandparents returned, I asked to go home. My friend explained what happened, and her grandmother said that there was nothing to worry about, that her sister just liked playing with kids. She also told her sister to knock it off because she was scaring me. Convinced that they were all insane, I called my mom and I went home, telling my friend that I'm sorry for not staying. Two or three years later, the house randomly caught on fire when nobody was there. The whole house was destroyed, but they couldn't find the cause. The fireman said that it started in the piano room and blamed faulty wires, but the grandmother was sure her sister did it because they were thinking about selling the house. I guess it made the little girl mad. I still don't believe in the paranormal, but I know someone was in that room, and I can't think of a logical explanation. I'm a woman who experiences sleep paralysis often, and it's not fun. I recently moved into a new house in a beautiful village with a gorgeous view of the river. But what happened here, it's horrible. I lived a normal life, made friends in town. Life seemed perfect. Then one night I woke up and I couldn't move. This seemed... I regularly experienced sleep paralysis. But after a few minutes, I looked out the window and I saw a boy... He had an unusually large grin. It seemed to be full of evil. Since I was paralyzed, I couldn't react. Then, the figure walked towards the door. I heard it open, and I heard his wet footsteps coming closer and closer. Until the boy entered my room. He leaned over me, his huge grin directly above my face. Then... I snapped out of the paralysis and was asleep again. When I woke up, I found wet footprints on my floor, and a chill ran down my spine. I got dressed and drove into town. There, I talked to people who shared a tragic story. Long ago, a group of friends were playing near the river. As a joke, one of the children pushed a boy into the river. He couldn't swim, and he sank to the bottom. Villagers tried to save the boy, but they were too late. They found him, sitting on a rock, eyes cloudy, mouth open. It was like he sat there and waited to drown. People say his ghost will grab your ankles, pull you into his watery grave. I freaked the fuck out. I tried to sell the house, but I couldn't because it's apparently famous for being haunted. I just hope I can get out of this place. Aside from the lights shutting off on their own, or the faint sense of being watched, there was one undeniable moment when I realized my basement is truly haunted. I was only supposed to be down there for a minute. I was storing away some boxes, didn't bother turning on the light. After setting everything down, I started back towards the stairs. But for some reason, I stopped to wonder how long I could calmly sit in the dark. I 
stood very still and took deep, calming breaths while saying a random mantra of mine. Fear is just a mechanism, an evolutionary trait that helped us survive when sleeping in dark caves. After a few repeats, I heard a fucking growl. It sounded like a zombie. It was loud. I instantly noped out, sprinted up the stairs. I was on the ground floor in under a second. I know nothing chaotic happened, but hearing such a real and angry growl after ten minutes of utter silence, it confirmed that something supernatural was living in my basement. This really happened five years ago and I can still hear the growl in my head. And if you're wondering, it wasn't the boiler. It was a finished basement. I even had an Xbox down there. I would literally game for hundreds, maybe thousands of hours. Not once, never, did I hear the boiler make anything remotely close to that sound. My husband, Hank, and I were still engaged when living in the home we called the Hammond House. It was named after the neighborhood. We lived there for five years and moved out shortly after our wedding. It was built in the 1970s, and too many strange things happened to relay them all, but I'll try. Before we even moved in, an elderly woman died inside. It was heavily remodeled after a fire and someone had crashed their car through the living room. The activity we experienced started off small and escalated. The first night, we unpacked everything and got the house ready to be lived in. I was having trouble falling asleep when I felt an overwhelming urge to look down, and I saw a fat cockroach crawl beneath our bed. We hadn't even eaten in there yet. I know it's not supernatural, but it definitely felt like a bad omen. Hank has a shelf full of memorabilia that he arranges in a very particular order, and on countless mornings, we've woken up to find everything shifted out of place, just by a few inches. Sometimes the items would be turned diagonally, but remain in their proper positions. In his signed football souvenirs, they'd be face down and turned in the completely opposite direction. We discussed possible explanations, tested theories like maybe our speakers are vibrating hard enough to move things, but none of the explanations panned out. This is when we jokingly began referring to these events as goblin activity. Several people lived with us during our time spent in the Hammond house, including my friends Charlotte and Laura, along with Hank's teenage niece and nephew, Abby and Andy. Everyone who stayed there reported hearing someone else's voice, even when that person wasn't home. Andy heard Laura and I laughing in my room while I was at work. Laura heard me loudly whispering to Hank while he slept, but again, I was at work. Charlotte heard Hank pacing our bedroom while having a heated argument, but he was actually at work. Abby heard me and Charlotte cooking in the kitchen, when neither of us were home. And Hank, he heard our cat meowing while she was sleeping in his lap. Abby also had terrible night terrors while living with us, but she never had them before or since. She'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming and convinced someone was banging on her bedroom door. We let our husky, Cal, sleep with her on those nights. From the living room couch... I could see through the dining room window and into the bedroom window. I would get chills, look to my bedroom window, and see the curtains deliberately pulled back just a few inches, as if someone were sneaking a peek. There were no vents under the window, no airflow. There was no viable explanation for this. After the first time, I started keeping the door shut and leaving the overhead fan off. Just to make sure I wasn't mistaken, 
but the curtain only moved when I was home alone. Ultimately, we bought a curtain for the dining room window to ease my wariness, but it didn't help my overall state of mind very much. This next one, it isn't supernatural, but it is pertinent to the story. Over the course of one year, all three of our dogs died in that house. Two two two-year-old husky siblings passed from a genetic kidney disorder that they shared. And Cal succumbed to cancer at age 12. I know it's irrational, but I blame that house for stealing my babies. The puppies died before Cal, and he became very attached to me afterwards. But he also developed an almost aggressive distrust for our hallway closet. He would constantly lay there sniffing under the door or pacing like something was in there. We checked multiple times, but there was nothing. One day, he was guarding the closet when I was home alone and in the shower, which is next door to this closet. When I bent over to grab the soap, I heard an unknown male voice coming from the closet. I quickly got out of the shower, still dripping wet. I inched my way to the door, listening. Hello? I finally whispered, but there was no response. I pressed my ear against the door, like the cliché that I am, and I heard a scratching sound. I screeched and ran to my bedroom with Cal, where we remained, barricaded and crying, until Hank came home. On another night... I was half asleep and waiting for Hank to come home when I woke to a sinking sensation of someone slipping onto his side of the bed. I flung my arm out to feel for him, but no one was there. I couldn't sleep until he got home. The last thing that happened before we moved is the event that shook me the most. I used to lay in my recliner, and my long hair would dangle over the back. My cat always saw this as a toy and tried to climb my hair like a curtain. So, when I felt my hair being tugged, I didn't think anything of it until I realized the cat was sleeping in my lap. The moment I realized that was happening, the grip on my hair was released. Once again, I screamed, cried, and hid in my room until Hank came home. There's so many smaller things that aren't even worth mentioning. Little items went missing and reappearing in strange places. It was always something we needed, like a tool or a key. We moved shortly after the hair-pulling incident, and we haven't had any goblin activity since. I'm not looking for advice. I just needed a place to get this off my chest. For the last month, I've been visiting my boyfriend in Germany, and I've been hearing strange noises in his apartment. There's been scratching in the walls, heavy footsteps and thuds, but nothing super crazy. I just thought his neighbors were being weird, but apparently he only has one neighbor, an old man who lives on the opposite end of the hall. The rooms on either side of us are empty. He even confirmed it with the landlord. Last week, he told me about a shadowy, tall man with gray eyes who would sometimes open his door and peek inside. The first few times it happened, he thought it was an intruder, but it only ever peeks at him from the crack in the door. The apartment is entered through the hallway. And then there's a door to the bedroom. This entity can unlock the front door and open the bedroom door, just enough to look in on him. My boyfriend tries to ignore it. To be honest, I thought he was experiencing signs of schizophrenia or trying to scare me. But after last night, I believe him. We heard scratching again, so my boyfriend tapped on the wall and it actually answered him. It even unlocked the door last night. Today, 
The entity moved a key from his desk to another counter. And I know my boyfriend didn't do it because I was too scared to sleep last night. He never left my sight until he went to work. I haven't seen the entity yet, but my boyfriend says that this is the first time it's ever moved something. We think it enjoys scaring me, so I'm trying my best to stay calm. This apartment building used to be a retirement home, and the other floors are full, but the rent is more expensive. Please help. This is my first time dealing with something like this, and I am beyond scared. We need help. I don't know what to do. An update. It came back again tonight. I mixed salt and water together like a comment on my previous post suggested, and I sprinkled it around the entry room. I think I made it angry. I went to get dinner out of the oven, but I was afraid the ghost might be behind the door. I made my boyfriend stand in front of it, and the entity started banging on the door like crazy. But when my boyfriend opened it, nothing was there. He thinks he saw it in the mirror, though. I'm sobbing. I can't do this anymore. I don't know how he's lived like this for over a year. Next day update. Thankfully, there was no sign of it last night, and the entry room was extremely warm. My boyfriend said it hasn't been that warm in the whole time he's lived there. So I guess that means we can tell if it's here or not by temperature. At four o'clock yesterday evening, we showered together, and things were fine until my boyfriend noticed the entity trying to open the bathroom door. But it couldn't do it. It was extremely cold in the entry room, and once we made it to the bedroom, I yelled for it to go away, saying it wasn't welcome. After a few minutes, the room warmed up again. Maybe the salt water did help a bit. I don't know what else could have weakened it. Maybe it has to do with me not being so frightened anymore. I used to have tons of paranormal experiences until I turned 18. Then they just stopped for nearly 20 years. Six months ago, I started getting super interested in the paranormal again. I've been reading about other people's experiences here, listening to podcasts, and now things have started happening again. I believe the more attention you give the paranormal, even indirectly, the more energy they'll have to interact with you. I started dating my ex-wife in 2009, and we moved into her parents' old house in 2010, 2011. They always believed there to be a presence, but apart from a few silly teenage girl moments, no real experiences ever happened. When we moved in, we always sensed something not really malevolent, but powerful enough to make you uneasy. Even so, the first real experience didn't happen until a decade later, in 2020, after we separated and I moved out. In my new place, I occasionally feel a small presence, but I chalk it up to imagination or someone watching over me. Who knows what all is there that we can't see? We can only speculate. This brings us to six months ago, when I started reading people's stories each night before falling asleep. Now that I'm giving more attention to that world, it seems I'm beginning to feel the presence much stronger. Weird, for sure, but I continue immersing myself. Then, in October, I had a new experience while in my basement converted bedroom. The stairs are ridiculously loud. You can always hear them over the TV or music, even if you're trying to be sneaky. One morning, at 6.18, I woke up, got dressed, and relaxed on the couch with my phone before I had to leave for work. My roommates were still asleep, and the house was dead silent. The couch was facing my open bedroom door, and I suddenly heard the loud, creaky stairs as something slowly walked down all 13 steps. 
There was no reason for anyone to come down there, but I thought a roommate might be trying to catch me before I left. I waited a couple of minutes, and there were no more sounds. But suddenly, the same loud steps marched back upstairs. Even more strange was that they fell silent at the top. The hall floor is also absurdly loud and creaky. You can always hear any time someone walks away, until now. It just isn't possible. I even tested it with a roommate later that day. I asked each roommate if they were up at that time. But they each said no. I did everything in my power to explain it, but I can't. I also want to tell you about other instances involving my ex-wife. We're still friends, and she's currently living in our old house, but we're getting ready to sell it. She's moving to a new state with her boyfriend, and I'm returning to my home state. Since her roommates are moving out, and we have a few repairs to make before selling, I moved back in. Immediately, I felt the presence in that house stronger than ever before, probably because I'm still reading and listening to stories every night. Well, one evening, I was helping my ex-wife with a cleaning job at a church for a little extra cash. She hates going alone because she thinks it's haunted. There's a specific room where she always feels a presence, and it makes her extremely uneasy. A friend decided to tag along, and when we got there, they asked me to handle the room since I don't rattle easily. I tried to get in, but the door was locked. While waiting for my ex to come unlock it, I walked down the hall to run an extension cord. When I turned back, our friend was turning stark white. When questioned, he said the door to that room had slowly opened as I went past. Take that as you will, just a door coming unlatched or paranormal. But it was a heavy, solid door with a sturdy lock. Anyway, I tried recording some audio, but so far I've captured nothing. I'll keep trying when the opportunities arise. Oh, I also say, you're not allowed to follow us, attach yourself to us, or feed off of our energy every time we leave the church. I have one more experience I want to close this out with. It happened during the first week of December, when my wife left town. I was alone in the house for a couple of months. One day, a friend who is sensitive to spirits was visiting, and we began discussing the strong presence in the house. It felt significantly stronger since being alone. My friend said he'd felt something watching us from the kitchen all evening, and nervously changed the subject. That night, I read some stories, plugged in my phone, turned off the lights and laid down. But I was still very much awake when I felt something pat the bed next to my foot. It felt like someone took their open palm and firmly patted the mattress several times. I was definitely alone. There's no way it was a person. Calmly, I said, Do not mess with me while I'm in bed. You're not allowed to feed off of my energy. Please respect my home and my boundaries. I tried not to freak out as I tucked the blanket under my body like a protective shield, and I tried to sleep. Since then, I don't read the stories every night. I should let things calm down until I'm not alone anymore. But here I am, typing this at midnight, when I should be going to sleep. Still, home alone. I guess we'll see if anything new happens. I wanted to share something I experienced a few years ago in my previous apartment. I'm sure that place was haunted. Many weird things happened, and despite my best efforts, I couldn't discern any rational explanations. I won't make a list of everything that happened, 
A lot of it was just common paranormal stuff like feelings of being watched, things moving around, and random footsteps. The stuff we've all heard before. Today I want to talk about the weirdest thing that happened. I've loved paranormal stories for years, and I've read thousands, but I've never heard any that compare to my own. In my bedroom, a light would sometimes appear high up on the wall, just behind my bed. But there was no source. It wasn't a lamp reflection or the moon. It's like the light was in the wall. It's really hard to explain. It was a pale, phosphorescent white and shaped like a rectangle. I noticed it in the first days of living there, and I thought the previous owners had left behind a child's nightlight. But nothing was there. The wall looked completely normal. One night, I showed my mom, but she only brushed it off. It wasn't every night, either. Sometimes it was two or three nights in a row. Then there would be nothing for a few weeks. I used to be too afraid to look at it while lying in bed. It normally appeared five minutes after turning off the lights, and it would stay for hours. If I woke up in the night, it was usually gone. One day, I tried covering it with a poster, but that shit moved just next to it. Have you ever experienced anything similar? I've never had a clue what it was. There wasn't anything in the room. I checked many times. I don't have any pictures. It happened before phones were capable of being good cameras. Plus, I was slightly in denial. Hi, everybody. I'm writing to share some experiences I believe to be paranormal. It's also important to note that what I say here is only my testimony. I don't have any physical evidence, and you're free to believe it or not. Everything happened in the house I've lived in since age four, and my grandparents' house, which is like a second home since they're just five minutes away. I spent most of my time with them when I was younger. My house was built on an ancient vine culture, but I don't have any more information about the land. My grandparents don't know anything about the past of their house or land. My first experiences began at age nine. Before, I never had any disturbing experiences outside of night terrors, but nothing abnormal. I grew up in a Catholic family, so I was never taught that spirits existed. To me, ghosts were cartoon figures, draped in white sheets with holes cut out for the eyes. I didn't understand that human souls could stay on Earth. Moms always said good souls go to heaven and bad souls go to hell. I never questioned it. I wasn't even interested. Honestly, I was just a kid with other interests. Mom never believed in the paranormal anyway. And Dad was even more skeptical. We had four bedrooms in our house. Three were on the first floor, and the guest bedroom on the second floor was basically used as an attic. The downstairs bedrooms were mine, my brothers, and my parents. But then, Mom learned she was pregnant again. As the oldest, I had to move upstairs. The room was large, with a private bathroom, but... Back then, I still didn't like it. I couldn't sleep for the first two years. It always felt like there was something heavy in the atmosphere, something watching me. Sometimes, I get very cold in the middle of summer, and it's hot where I live. Until age 11, I spent all of my time in the living room, or my little sister's room. Then... I finally found the courage to move back into my bedroom, but things got worse. It was only noise at first. Every night, 
When Dad turned off the TV, I heard noises from the living room. The light switch turned on and off. It's loud when used. Dad's gaming chair rolled around, and someone ran barefoot on the hard floor, like kids running around. There were also other strange noises, as if someone would sweep for hours. One evening, someone went up the stairs very fast. It was so clear in the beginning, I thought it was my brother, but when I checked, no one was there. Sometimes, while in bed, I'd feel someone's touch or breath. Or sometimes, there was a heavy weight on the bed. I was terrified and cried in terror when I felt the hot breath on my face. A lot of things started disappearing, too. Some of mine in my sister's clothes, a karaoke mic, mom's lace shoes, a file with our car papers... And everyone knew it wasn't a joke. The car was being sold. We understood the importance of papers. And our family isn't big on jokes. Mom isn't a believer in the paranormal. But even she admitted to weird noises and doors randomly opening. She once saw my brother running through the garden and called to him from a window. But when he answered, the voice didn't come from outside. It came from his bedroom, and nobody was in the garden. Sometimes there were strange noises on the roof as well, like people with heavy footsteps were running. Now she also hears loud footsteps coming from my room at 4 a.m. while I'm still sleeping. Maybe I'm sleepwalking, but I don't move furniture or make things fall while I'm asleep. I would notice that things were different the following morning. The first big event happened at my house when I was 14. It was during Eastern holidays, so my siblings were gone for a week, and I was left alone with my parents. It was a sunny afternoon, and Dad was working in the garden while I read a book with Mom on the opposite side. At four, I went inside via a living room window. Some of the windows were easily used as doors, and I made a peanut butter sandwich. Directly across from where I entered was another window looking out to where my dad worked, and on the left, the kitchen. I went to the kitchen, and when almost finished eating, I heard the garden window open. Mom was going outside, probably to talk with Dad, but I wasn't paying attention. I just closed the peanut butter and went back to my seat. But suddenly, Mom was there, reading a book. How could she have been there when she was on the other side of the garden ten seconds prior? If she'd passed by the living room again, it would have put her behind me. She would have had to circle the house to enter from the opposite direction to be in front of me. A few years ago, Mom had an accident and the ligaments in her ankle were badly damaged. She still can't walk really fast. I asked what she was doing, but she seemed confused, responding that she hadn't gone anywhere, and that she had no reason to lie. We ran a test with my brother. If she was by the kitchen window, she would have had to run, but she physically can't. I just don't understand what I saw that day. And it's terrifying. It's also important to note that Dad's friend was trying to sleep upstairs. This was before I moved into that guest room. He later said he couldn't sleep because it felt really bad in there. Like he was being watched. And he isn't the type to believe in spirits. He's actually an engineer and a skeptic. A few months ago... We adopted a very calm, very sweet Shih Tzu puppy. He never barks, and he quickly became comfortable in his new home. One day, I wanted to take him upstairs with me since Mom wasn't home, but he got upset the moment we entered my room. 
He kept looking around and barking. But they weren't aggressive barks. They were frightened barks. He started scratching at the door like he wanted out. But he'd never done that before. He was squealing in terror and only calmed down after we left my room. The next incident happened at my grandparents' house. They have an extra bedroom that used to be my mom's, but she never experienced anything strange in it. I, on the other hand, never could stay in that room. Sometimes, while playing hide-and-seek, I would hide behind an old table, and it always left me feeling nauseous and cold, even in the summer. Once, while Grandma was sick, I tried to clean that room with a friend, but we couldn't do it. Within 30 minutes, my friend was feeling uneasy. Her head began hurting just a few seconds after I became nauseous. While cleaning, the sponge magically disappeared and reappeared in plain sight five minutes later. Two years ago, when I was 17, I stayed at my grandparents' house for Christmas. But some of the radiators were broken, including the one in my room. That meant I had to sleep in my mom's old room, and I tried reassuring myself I could manage for a single weekend. At 10 p.m., I went to bed planning to read and chat with friends. The ambiance was nice even though the room was freezing. I eventually turned off the lights and went to sleep. But it was the most terrifying moment of my life. I heard scratching noises from inside the walls, and I felt a weight on my bed. During some moments, it even felt like something was lying beside me. And when I finally passed out from sheer exhaustion, I had the strangest dream ever. I was in a room that looked like a little public swimming pool, but there was only one small pool. There was a balcony with bright green plants, small candles, and an old lady lying on a white mat. She was very pale, with long white hair, blue eyes. She was wearing a white nightgown. She wasn't scary, but it felt very strange. The woman called me closer with a sweet voice and took me into her arms. Then she began to cry, saying she was happy to see me, but she had cancer and would die very soon. That's when I woke up. I was crying, but the bedroom was warm, just like in my dream. I felt extremely sad, and even now... I feel sadness, but there is also an intense sweetness. I don't know who this woman is. I've never met her. Well, that's everything. I know this was long, but there was a lot to share, and there's still so much that hasn't been said. If you have any answers or theories, it'd honestly be great to hear. It's truly terrifying to live here. Thanks for listening. I wish you all the best. At my mom's house, my room was in the basement, and the only way to get into the furnace room was through my room. The way my bed was set up, I was on the side that I could see directly into the furnace room, because there was no door separating my room from the furnace room. So, one night, when I was lying in bed, I saw a cat walk out of the furnace room, kind of look around my room, and after I blinked, it was gone. So, after that, I talked to one of my friends whose family was friends with the people we bought the house from, and she told me that their cat actually died in the house. I'm not sure if it died in my room or not, though. Another time, I was suffering from an ear infection, but my mom would never believe me when I told her that I was having problems. She always thought I was doing it for attention or being dramatic. So again, I was lying in bed, not being able to do anything because of the pain. And there is a possibility I was hallucinating from the pain. 
but I saw a man standing in my doorway. He was around average height, but he was built and he had wide shoulders. I was watching him for around 10 seconds when I heard a deep man's voice ask me if I was okay. I didn't feel scared. It almost lessened the pain, and I fell asleep. Around a day or two later, my mom told me that she woke up to a man standing at the foot of her bed, and she felt him tapping her foot. She told the man to go away, and after she said that, she felt like she was being pushed into the bed. When she was describing the man, it matched exactly what I saw. One night when I was in bed, I was looking at the laundry room, which was open, and I saw a woman walk in wearing a white dress. I remember her being pretty and not creepy at all. So I walked into the laundry room and it was empty. So I went upstairs in the living room because my stepdad was still awake watching TV. So I told him what happened. He said he saw the same woman walk downstairs. One time when I was home alone, I was sitting on the couch watching TV. It was a couple of days after my brother's birthday, so he had one of those helium balloons in his room upstairs. So I was watching TV when I see the balloon floating down the stairs. It stops right in front of me, like something was trying to play with me. At first, I thought it could have been an open window, but I realized all the windows were closed. And it had to have left his room, floated down the stairs, and turn towards me, and then stop, which kind of freaked me out. So I told my parents, but they laughed at me for getting freaked out by a balloon. But a couple of days later, the same thing happened to them. But the weird part was, they were sitting in different seats than I was. So I don't think it was a draft or anything. The last story freaked me out the most, but could have also been my imagination. I'm not sure. So one night I was in bed. My stepdad had built a wall to cover the furnace room doorway that was in my room, and then made a doorway outside my room in the hallway so it was easier to get in. As I'm lying there, I can see a shape of a person peeking into my room and then quickly ducking back into the furnace room. I watched whatever it was do that for around ten minutes. But the weird part, it was really dark in my room, but whatever it was was darker than that darkness, if that makes sense. I only saw that thing one time, so I don't know if it was me imagining it or not. Last March, my friends and I went to Chattanooga for my best friend's bachelorette party. We stayed at a beautiful Airbnb on the Tennessee River with a private and peaceful atmosphere. It was also on a nature trail. It felt isolated, but it was close enough to the city for us to have some fun. We had a great time out, and then we returned to the house where we started a fire. We relaxed until we got tired and went to bed. We decided to all bunk in the room that had three bunk beds and one regular bed. We wanted to watch a movie together, but in the end, we needed to sleep before the drive back more than a movie. Unlike my friends, I'm not used to falling asleep early, so I was wide awake and scrolling through my phone. I know it's a bad habit, but it's all I had. As I laid there, I started to get a bad feeling. I've had one paranormal experience before this, but it didn't scare me. I was just confused. This was different. My hair stood on end like something with bad intentions was nearby. I looked at the others on the bunk beds, but they all seemed fine, so I kept scrolling. Only the feeling came back again, 
and this time I looked towards the regular bed where the bride and her little niece were sleeping. There was a dark figure standing over them, its head bent to stare at the little girl, and my heart stopped. I couldn't move. I kept telling myself it was just a shadow from the stairway. I looked down at my phone, hoping for the courage to text my boyfriend, though, considering he doesn't believe in anything, he was no help. He just said I was seeing things. So we hung up. When I looked up again, the figure was gone. If anything, that made me feel even worse. It confirmed the figure was more than just a shadow from the stairway. I jumped out of bed, ran upstairs, and slept on the couch. I felt like a small child who had just watched a horror movie. I kept hearing the stairs creak, told myself it was just the house settling. I called my boyfriend back, and he eventually talked me down. I knew he was probably right, but I was still shaken up. I finally fell asleep around four when the creaking stopped. But I woke up around six, and I had to go downstairs for my bag. A few minutes later, the maid of honor came upstairs looking confused and a bit freaked out. She asked if the bride had been upstairs, and I said only if it was during the two hours I was actually asleep. Apparently, it was about the time I'd woken up when she thought she saw the bride come up there. I told her it wasn't possible, but she insisted someone had gone up the stairs. Her face was white, and I told her to go see if everyone was still in bed. They were. We both stood in silent confusion for a moment before confirming that she saw it after I woke. I suggested that she might have heard me moving around. That's when she said she thought someone had been standing over the bride's niece, and my heart stopped. I didn't have to say anything. My face said it all, and she knew I saw it too. Needless to say, we were happy to get out of there without further investigation, but I felt guilty for not staying downstairs now that I know it wasn't just my anxiety. I don't know if this is related, but a few months later I learned that Hale's Bar is supposedly one of the most haunted places in Tennessee, and it's only two miles from that house. They also had an old cabin from the 1800s on the property, and it definitely had some weird vibes too. It probably didn't help that they had pictures of the original owners in there, I don't remember their names, so I can't search for a relation to the bar.